If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn with me to the Acts of the Apostles and to chapter 24. As you're turning there, let me say what a privilege it is to be here in arguably one of the loveliest cities in all of uh, North America. And um, to be in this church uh, building is uh, something I've looked forward to because of my association and relationship with Gary and with Paige, and to be able to express my own personal gratitude to the radio station here for uh, the fact that they entertain our program and give us an opportunity to uh, speak to you on a daily basis. And um, I so desperately wish I had Georgine's hair. <laughs> I, should, I, I want you to know that I've got nothing at all to do with all of that stuff about dialing up numbers on your phone and giving money. I, just, just because my name is Beg, it's got nothing at all. <laughs> it has nothing at all to do with that. The name Beg actually means small. It's a Gallic word. It's got nothing to do with uh, asking for money. And as a Scotsman, it really offends me that we're giving so much away in any case. And uh, <laughs> so. But it is a joy to be here, and I, I'll speak, and then we'll have a song, and then we'll have an opportunity for some Q&A. But I want to read from Acts chapter 24, uh, beginning at the first verse. And after five days, uh, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul, and when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation in every way and everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you've been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation should they have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council, other than this one thing, that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, when Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul, so he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, 
Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. We thank God for his word. Just a brief prayer as we look to it now. Gracious God, here we are, and you know us thoroughly because you made us. We are yours by creation, but not all of us are yours by redemption. And so we pray now that as we have this opportunity to have the searchlight of your word shine into our lives, that you will open our minds in order that we might think properly, that you will open our hearts in order that we might welcome you gladly. We look away from ourselves to you. All our hope, all our confidence is in you. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All rise. This court is in session. Ever since I've been a boy, I have been fascinated by that phrase. I think it's a strange thing for a small boy to want to go into courtrooms and see what's going on, but it was due to the fact that I saw Perry Mason, I think, <laughs> on television. And I thought that he was in all of those courtrooms and that every case was eventually settled uh, in his favor and for the well-being of everyone. And even now, when I visit in cities, if I have undue amounts of spare time, one of the things that I like to do is to go and see if there is any trial being conducted in a court so that I can just watch the people at work. It's not a morbid fascination, I don't think. It is more to do with the way in which uh, uh, lawyers are able to present a case and defendants are able to present their side of things and so on. And so when I come to a chapter like Acts chapter 24, it really is uh, right up my street, as it were. And what I want to do is just walk us through this chapter, paying particular attention to the way in which it ends. And you will notice, as I tried to read it as carefully as I could, that what has happened is that Paul has been uh, summoned before this governor, Felix. Uh, the charges that have been brought against him are now going to be presented by this uh, uh, council, as it were, this man, uh, Tertullus. And Tertullus begins uh, in the way that you see most lawyers beginning. If you go in a courtroom, um, and this, I, I, I want to admit, uh, please, there's nothing offensive here in what I'm saying about lawyers, but it does seem to me that they, they, they do try to curry favor with the judge very quickly and to try and make sure that uh, they're, they're on his right side. And this chap is doing the self same thing. He starts off with a bunch of nonsense here. Since, since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, blah, blah, blah. If you read the history, none of this was actually true. It's a bunch of hot air. Uh, but nevertheless, this is the way that he leads into things. If he's, he's, he is akin to Polonius and Hamlet. If you remember Polonius and Hamlet, he was full of this kind of nonsense himself. Uh, my liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night, night, and time is time, were nothing but to waste both night, day, and time. And since brevity is the soul of wit, and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. <laughs> you, will notice, you will notice that that is his exact approach here. I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. That's at the end of verse 4. Yes, we would like to hear you briefly, so would you step up and tell us what it is you're on about? So his case for the prosecution really has three points. Number one, he says this fellow that is before you is a plague. He's an absolute troublemaker. That's what's been going on with him. Secondly, he is a ringleader of this Nazarene sect. He's not orthodox. He is a heretical chap. And thirdly, in his time in the temple, he was attempting to desecrate it. That's the sum and substance of what he has to say. And he then wraps it up in verse 8 by saying, by examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. So it's not really so much the case for the prosecution as it is an accusation. And the accusation comes across clearly. And in verse 9, we're told that the Jews who had accompanied him and were using him as their spokesman, they were all nodding their heads uh, and affirming that all these things were so, as if somehow or another, the more they nodded their heads, the more true it would, would actually be. 
And uh, there's a, nod, a lot of nodding of heads going on because the governor, he started to nod his head in verse 10 as well. And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, then Paul replied. And so you very quickly go from the prosecution to the defense. And what Paul says is very clear, isn't it? He, sa he says well, there's absolutely no basis for these charges. There's no doubt about the fact that I was in Jerusalem. That can be verified. But if you check around, Felix, you will discover that what they're saying just isn't true. And he said, but if you would like me to confess to something, then let me confess to this. And you will notice what he says. Uh, I worship, first of all, the God of our fathers. I worship the God of our fathers. In other words, their attempt to isolate me from the orthodox position of the prophets before me is skillful, but it isn't true. Secondly, I believe what accords with the law and with the prophets. You see, what they're saying is that here's, he's here with some newfangled doctrine, some new idea, some sectarian concept. He says, no, you need to understand, I believe in the God of our fathers. I teach and I believe in accord with the law and with the prophets. Thirdly, I share the same hope as these fellows do in the resurrection of both the just and the unjust to eternal life. And fourthly, he says, I strive to have a clear conscience. And then he says, but really, what this is all about is something that I said when I was there in the temple. And he said, I can acknowledge this. And if you have a Bible open before you, at the page that is the same as mine, you can see in verse 6 of chapter 23 exactly where, it, where this unfolds. And in the context to which this trial is referring, Paul, seeing that one part of his audience were Sadducees, they were the folks who didn't believe in the resurrection. That was why they were sad, you see. That's how you always, that's how you always, that's the Sunday school way to remember the difference. And since I'm just basically an overgrown Sunday school boy, that's how I remember it too. So don't get snotty with me, all right? So when he perceived that one part were Sadducees, and the others were Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. Very clever, because now he's going to divide and conquer. Now his opposition are going to be separated from one another on the strength of the issue of the resurrection. And he puts the cat among the pigeons. That leads to the hullabaloo. But it has nothing to do with the desecration of the temple. He had come there to bring alms. He had come there to bring an offering. He had come there in, in, in all full regalia, as it were, of the purification of the ceremonial rites and responsibilities. So this is the real reason, he says. It is with respect to the issue of the resurrection that I am standing before you today. And so Felix is confronted by the challenge of what to do. And we're told in verse 22 that he, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, it's very interesting, isn't it? Paul has described himself as uh, confessing that according to the way, which became known, which became uh, it's a bit like uh, some of the churches today, you never have a thing that's called like a church or anything, it's called like the orchard or the pineapple or the, or the whatever it is. And so they were already referred to as the way. Jesus said, I am the way. They were on the way, the narrow way. And so he says, it's according to the way that I confess to these things. Well, interestingly, Luke tells us that Felix had a rather accurate knowledge of the way. All that's contained in that, we don't really know. But he decided that instead of settling the issue, he would use as an adjournment the strategy of saying, when Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. There's no indication that Lysias the Tribune ever came down uh, because the case was never decided. So in other words, what he's actually doing, he's adjourning. He's putting it off. He's buying some time. He treats Paul kindly, though. You will notice in verse 23, he gave orders to the centurion that Paul should be kept in custody but have some liberty, that none of his friends should be pre prevented from attending to his needs. That's pretty nice, really. I mean, if you're going to be in jail, you might as well be in a nice jail like this. And that is exactly how the thing stands. And then it gets really interesting. Because when you think about it, when you go in a court of law and you see the judge, 
and he's there, and he's, he's very judgy. You know, he's the judge. So, was it laughing where they had, he come the judge. But um, so he is, he, is the, he is the judge. But he has to go home. And his wife probably doesn't call him like, hello, judge. She would say, hello, Bill, or how was your day, and stuff like that. So there's always, there's always a life behind that public life, isn't there? There's always where the person has to finally go home and, you know, get his slippers on and, 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 and it just get normal all of a sudden. And I love that. Don't you always want to find out what happens when they get home? And, and, and here's, here's what happens. They've been playing Scrabble for four nights in a row, and, and, and they're getting bored with it. So Drusilla says, what about that fellow that you've got in custody? I hear he's quite a preacher. Why don't, we, why don't we have him come up and do his thing for us? Why do, why, we, could, we could have him uh, give a talk. Now, Felix said, well, that's not a bad idea. And so Luke tells us after some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, a Jewish princess, and he sent for Paul. And when Paul came, he heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. Now, that's remarkable, isn't it? Let's say you had been on a trumped-up charge. The people had come down, they presented the case, it was postponed, it was adjourned. You were now put in custody, and the fellow who had been your judge, who was in charge of you, gave you the opportunity to come and do a little talk. What do you think you'd talk about? Number one, you'd talk about, when am I getting out? right? If you're sensible at all. Or you might talk about a number of things. But Paul doesn't do any of that stuff. He listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. In other words, he presumably told him the nature of what had happened to him, gave him his testimony, if you like, explained to him that what he was about and why he was doing what he was doing and why these things were in concurrence with the Old Testament and so on, it was all there for him to explain. And Paul was routinely doing this. All the way through Acts, you find him doing the same thing. So he goes into the synagogues, and he explains to the people in the synagogues. You can see this, for example, in Acts chapter 17 at the beginning. He, he goes into the synagogue, and he explains to them that the Christ had to suffer and die. So he's explaining to them that the, that the death of the Messiah had to take place. And then once he has explained to them from the Old Testament that this was foreshadowed in a number of ways and that, that Christ had to suffer and die, he then said to them, and this Jesus that I proclaim to you is that Christ. Okay? So in other words, he was making very, very clear what faith in Christ meant. He was explaining that Jesus died in the place of sinners. He was explaining that he was the sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb, that he was the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He, didn't, he doesn't use this as an opportunity for some political rendition. He doesn't use this as an opportunity to, to, to ease his own personal circumstances. No, because he has been set apart to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here he is with an opportunity to address in this context the judge and his wife. And he speaks to them about faith in Christ Jesus. When I was a child, again in Sunday school, the way they explained faith to me uh, was with an acrostic, F-A-I-T-H, forsaking all I trust him. Forsaking all, I trust him. Faith in Christ. Calvin in his institutes, in the, in the beginning of the book three, he says, all that Christ has done for us is of no value to us so long as we remain outside of Christ. So that this, this simply the knowledge of the death of Christ, the awareness of the truths concerning Christ, is of no value to us until we are placed into Christ, until we too come to trust in him, until we, forsaking all, take him. Now, this is what he was speaking to Felix about. 
And it is quite an, uh, an awesome thought to realize that Felix had been in the position where he thought he was deciding the case concerning Paul, and now Paul is here confronting this couple. Now, let me just back up and give you a little uh, history of, of these folks. Uh, Drusilla, uh, the two of them, were a society couple, really. Um, they, they, would have been in, in, they would have been in all of the magazines in, in, in the Portland airport, all of the, all of the stuff about with David Beckham and, and, and everybody else, and Victoria and, uh, and Prince William and, 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 every, and everybody in their uncle. They would have been in there. They would have been frequently in there. Old guy marries cute chick, all right? <laughs> Story repeated again and again and again. The history records that Drusilla had a reputation as a ravishing beauty, and that at this point, she was only in her 20s. She didn't come from a particularly nice family background. Her father was Herod Agrippa. He's the one who had James, the brother of John, killed. He's the one who was responsible for throwing Peter in the jail. Her uncle, Herod Antipas, was the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. And if that wasn't bad enough, her great-grandfather, Herod the Great, was the one who was responsible for the slaughter of the baby boys in Bethlehem at the time of the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. That's her lineage. That's her background. Plus, the two of them are in an adulterous relationship. He has stolen her away from her husband by the agency of a, of a Cyprian magician who worked his magic on somebody and finally secured her. He seduced her, took her to himself, and now they find themselves interwoven, intermarried, and would have fit perfectly, as I say to you, on the society pages. This is his congregation, a congregation of two, the judge and his bride. There they sit. Where does the power lie in this situation? You've looked on from the outside. Here comes Paul, brought up, summoned. They sit in the place of power and authority. Here comes the gospel messenger. Now listen as he outlines his sermon for them. He says, I only have three points from my uh, talk, and uh, I thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak to you. Incidentally, um, Felix's name <laughs> is another satisfied customer from Truthful Life. Um, yeah, Felix's name, um, that, wasn't his, that wasn't his given name. That wasn't the name his mom and dad gave him. He, he changed his name. Um, yeah, he had a very ignominious background. And uh, when he had been actually set free from a form of enslavement himself, he changed his name to Felix, which means happy. So he, he, he was actually called Mr. Happy. And uh, he was presumably quite happy uh, to be there with, uh, with young Drusilla. And uh, if their immoral relationship, if their willful, blatant, unashamed engagement with one another was public knowledge, then it makes it all the more striking when you look at this three-point talk. I just have three points. I'm going to speak to you, he said tonight. Uh, for my first point is on righteousness. Righteousness? What is righteousness? You mean like doing the right thing? You mean like doing wrong things when you should be doing right things? Yeah, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm going to talk about righteousness, about the fact that God has a law, an absolute standard, and that we violate his standard. And when we disobey him and when we have other gods before him and when we put ourselves before him and our own selfish interests before him and everything else, we are in the wrong with God. And the only way to put right with God is to have a righteousness. And if you're going to try and get a righteousness of your own, just in case you want to, let me tell you what the standard is, an absolute perfection. That's what he demands. Wow. And Paul perhaps would have told them, you know, I, and I actually tried that thing. Now, while I'm talking to you about uh, righteousness, he might have said to him, I, I was convinced that I was a righteous person too because I, I, was, I was so very religious. My background was wonderful. It was impeccable. I had the right kind of training. I had the right kind of schooling, the right kind of family lineage, and so on. And as it came to the issues of the law, I was really, I was almost pretty flawless. 
but it was a righteousness of my own. And then I realized that it would never be acceptable. That was when I encountered Jesus. That is why I'm talking to you, he says, about faith in Christ Jesus. Because I discover that Jesus Christ is really alive. That's why I was shouting about the resurrection in the temple. And this Jesus died upon the cross in order to provide for me a righteousness that I can never earn on my own. And you can imagine that the eyes of both of them were widened with the news as he told them that this righteousness is something that God demands if we are ever to stand before him. That this righteousness is something which God achieves in the atoning sacrifice of his son. That this righteousness is something which God declares in the good news of the gospel. And that this righteousness is something which God bestows upon all those who turn to him in repentance and in faith. So presumably, he unpacked some of these things and told them, you're not going to be able to do this with a righteousness of your own, but I can tell you that this righteousness that comes from God is apart from the law. The law and the prophets bear witness to it, and it comes through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So don't think that the, 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 the tone of judgment would have been in his voice as much as, as, as the reality of that truth would be conveyed with all of the compassion of somebody who realized that they were absolutely on that down road. If you like, Paul was on the side of the person who said, I'm so good that I don't need saved. If Felix was prepared to face up to things, he would probably be saying, I'm so bad, there's no way I could be saved. And the answer to both is found in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, a righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And you can imagine Paul conveying this to them as they sit there and look at him, and he's saying to them, and, and you too must believe as well, as I say to you tonight. You must believe. That's why when the Philippian jailer asked the question, what must I do to be saved? The answer wasn't join a church. The answer wasn't do what you want. The answer was believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Not the belief of an intellectual awareness, but the sitting down belief of trust, of resolution, of, of relying on nothing and on no one and on anything at all save who Jesus is and what he has done. Uh, presumably... Uh, Paul covered much more than this. And I hope he wouldn't mind me quoting from some of his stuff in Romans. While they were assessing that, he moved quickly to his second point, which was self-control. This is a pretty brave preaching, wouldn't you say? <laughs> self-control. How much do you know about self-control? Their relationship had been established on the basis of unbridled lust. They didn't really know much about self-control. Perhaps he explained to them the fruit of the Spirit, painted this beautiful picture of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. He said, look at this. The two of you are sitting there, and as far as the whole of the empire here thinks, as, as far as your jurisdiction is concerned, you are it. You have everything. But you don't really, do you? You don't, you don't have self-control. If you did, you wouldn't be sitting here like this. And he might have said to them, but I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to woo you. I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to draw you if I could. You see, if you think about it, the resurrection, which is at the very heart of all of this, and presumably had piqued the interest of, of, uh, of Felix as he was going, as he was sitting and listening to this stuff, that, that he had this knowledge of the way, that, that he said that, I have to confess the fact that I did stir it up in the temple, but I stirred it up because of the resurrection. And 
presumably Felix is saying, I wonder, I wonder if I really believe that that Jesus is alive. Or is, it, is this just a fairy story? Do you like fairy stories? I like fairy stories. I like elves. <laughs> I have creatures in my garden. I imagine they wake up at night and talk to each other. That's how crazy I am. <laughs> you say, well, I, I'm not sure you should be admitting that. We have children here tonight, and we've been, <laughs> we've been, we've been trying to sort them out with stuff like that, and you stand up here and do that. Well, did, did you ever read Tolkien on, on fairy stories? Did you ever read his stuff on fairy stories? It's pretty good. Because, because Tolkien says that fairy stories express the longings of the human heart. That there is a longing in the human heart, he says, for a supernatural realm, for a love that is stronger than death, for a good that can triumph over evil, and for a cr closer relationship to nature. And he says that the reason that fairy stories have an abiding power is because we all wish they were true. That's why you still read them. That's why they're not really written for children. That's why I don't feel ashamed to tell you that I like them. They're written for adults. And so when I think of Felix and Drusilla sitting there and they're wrestling with the resurrection, is this a fairy story? What is this all about? It's not a fairy story. The story of Christ, the story of the gospel, is actually the underlying reality to which all the fairy stories point. You see, it is all the deepest longings of the human heart are answered in the Christian gospel. There is going to be that closeness with nature because there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. There is a good that triumphs over evil in the cross. There is a love that is stronger than hate and evil. It is the love of Christ for sinners. And there is a supernatural realm into which we are brought by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there they sit. They got everything and they got nothing. It's like the 60s Mr. Businessman, isn't it? Itemize the things you covet as you squander through your life. This is Ray Stevens. Some of you guys are like, who's he? Don't worry. Google him. <laughs> Itemize the things you cover as you squander through your life. Bigger cars, better houses, term insurance on your wife and Tuesday evenings with your harlot. And on Wednesdays, it's your charlatan, and your analyst is high upon your list. Spending counterfeit incentive, wasting precious time and health, placing value on the worthless, disregarding priceless wealth. You can wheel and deal the best of them and steal it from the rest of them. You know the score. Their ethics are a bore. And 86 proof anesthetic crutches prop you to the top where the smiles are all synthetic and the ulcers never stop. When they take the final inventory, yours will be the same sad story everywhere. No one will really care. Let's have your autograph. Endorse your epitaph. And by the way, did you see your children growing up today? Hey, Mr. Happy, how happy are you? Finally, he says to them, and I, my final point is this, that there's a day that God has set. It's fixed. It's going to be absolutely fair. And it's going to be absolutely final. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after this comes judgment. And I would be doing you a disservice, he must have said to the two of them, if I suggested to you anything other than this. If this is the only opportunity, I might have said to them, that I have the chance to speak to you as straightforwardly as I do. It matters more to me, Mr. Happy and Mrs. Happy, that you are converted than that I am freed from custody. That is why I'm speaking to you as I speak. I didn't come here to curry your favor. I didn't come here to gain a political advantage. I didn't come here to get something from you or to get out from underneath your grip. I simply came up here to tell you this. This is the only glorious good news that I have for you, and it falls under these three headings, that God in Jesus has provided a righteousness that we could never attain to on our own, that the Lord Jesus Christ pours out the Holy Spirit upon us and makes us new from the inside out, and that these are matters of ultimate and eternal significance. And what does it say? Well, then it got a little uncomfortable. Well, Felix was alarmed 
alarmed. I don't misunderstand me, but I like that. I'd, I'd, like a, I'd like a few people to get alarmed when I preach once in a while. I'm so sick of preaching where everybody, everybody has to have a nice time. Everybody has to feel good about themselves. Everybody has to go home with a real positive message. What if you're going to go home and die tonight? What if you go home tonight and die in your sins? What good would the preacher possibly do for anybody in that context? That would be like going to your doctor and he knows that you have got a terminal illness that he can invade and do something about. But he tells you, no, it's nothing. It's just, it's just a chest cold. Just go home. Who would, who would ever pay attention to this character again? And so he's alarmed. And so he does what he can do. Uh, well, why don't you go back down you know, we've given you a nice place there. You've got an apartment, and we've tried to be nice to you. Get, uh, uh, just go away for now. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. See that? He's in the place of authority. I will summon you. And it's told by Luke that at the same time, he actually hoped that money would be given him by Paul. Golly, it's amazing, isn't it? And so he sent for him often and conversed with him because he thought he might be able to get a bribe. There's no indication that he ever, ever responded in personal faith and trust to the message that was given to him. What about Drusilla? Well, when they dug up Pompey, when they dug up Pompey, they only found two really significant figures from history. One was Pliny the Younger, and the other was Drusilla. She, in the August of A.D. 79, went with her boy, whose name was Agrippus or something like that, and they were spending time in the fashionable resort of Pompeii. And as they enjoyed the lifestyle of the rich and famous, there was first a slight rumbling in the distance that increased to a crescendo. And they, along with the other residents of Pompey, were engulfed in the eruption of Vesuvius. Sounds dramatic, doesn't it? History records it. I don't know what happened to Drusilla. But I know that this night, if you're prepared to pay attention to what's being said here, because it would be a strange group if there weren't some who are here and you are, you are at what I'd refer to as unconverted believers. Unconverted believers. You have a head knowledge of these things. Some of you could articulate them. You may even teach them in a Sunday school class. But all that Christ has done for you is to this point of no value to you because you have never actually turned to him in repentance and in faith. You have never, in the simple childlike words of the choruses we used to sing as children, said, into my heart, into my heart. Come into my heart today. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. But you will notice that first of all, we have to, have to understand that Christ came and lived and died and rose again. And then on the basis of the factual, historical reality of his personhood and of his death, on that basis, we invite him to be the Savior we acknowledge we need.